Hi, I'm Sammy Shams. Thanks for being here. And I will be talking about teen substance use, trying to demystify e-cigarettes, alcohol, and marijuana. All right, so the objectives for today's presentation um, include emphasizing the importance of targeting adolescents and young adults on substance use concerns, um, and then highlighting especially e-cigarettes alcohol and marijuana use and concerns among teens, as well as outlining warning signs and some protective factors that we can help grow, and then providing suggestions for parents, um, I guess, or teens themselves, if you're curious, and, and then answer any questions that you might have. So um, why are we targeting substance use among teens? Well, um, the top three substances that teens tend to use are alcohol, marijuana, and tobacco. Um, by 12th grade, the majority of students have tried alcohol. The majority of students have used marijuana. Almost the majority of students have tried cigarettes. And then um, a, a significant percentage of students have been inappropriately using prescription medicine without a prescription. So, um, this is obviously something that's happening that's not ideal. And um, so why, why is substance use risky for teens, especially teens? Um, so it actually uh, affects the growth and development of teens' brains. So obviously drugs are, affect your brain chemistry and affect how your brain functions. And for teens, that's a bigger deal than for adults because their brains haven't fully finished yet. They're still growing, they're still developing, they're still changing, and then use of substances interferes with optimal development. Um, so basically, like, let's get you all the way there before you start trying to interfere with your functioning. And then it also occurs with other risky behaviors, um, unprotected sex, drinking and driving, um, which are danger to your health and really your life. And then they contribute to other health concerns as well, long term, like heart disease, high blood pressure, and sleep disorders, because everybody seems to know that certain substances interfere with sleep, but they don't think about how that can affect their sleep patterns long term. And what we found and what this chart shows is that the earlier substance use starts, the more likely it is to continue and develop into a long-term substance use pattern that interferes with functioning throughout the life of teens, or humans, I should say. So let's start with e-cigarettes, um, that's vaping, jewels, pods. This is a whole area that I've had to educate myself on because it's new, it's young, and that's part of where a lot of the concerns come from. So what we can see is that um, we get all these awesome stats on how teens these days don't tend to use cigarettes. Um, but what's happening is that e-cigarette use is relatively prevalent. I'm not sure if you can read that, but it's 11.7% um, of high schoolers are using um, e-cigarettes. Okay, well, maybe that's better than cigarettes. But then a whopping 25% of high schoolers and 20% of middle schoolers, middle school, what's that, like 8 to 12? Like 8 to 13? That's kind of shocking. Um, they're using um, jewels and mini pods and things like that. And so we'll get more into this later, but um, e-liquids are poorly understood by everybody, including teens who are using it and their parents because they're new. We don't really understand the effects that these liquids will have, but they we know they have nicotine. And so nicotine itself is a substance that's a stimulant and has all sorts of effects that other stimulants have. And then um, it can just be a, a gateway to other addictive substances through that interaction of coping and use, which we'll get to later. And then it's Inhaling anything that's not beautiful, clean air is not great for your lungs. Like, just like how we try to avoid pollution and other things. So, um, 
obviously there's something suboptimal that's happening with this use. So what is vaping? This has been coming on the market uh, since what? The early 2000s? And it was originally pitched as this like anti-smoking, quit smoking, healthier option. And so what we know is that an e-cig or a Juul, they, they, they operate under the same mechanisms, though they have slightly different presentations. So an e-cigarette um, and a Juul, they're battery powered, powered and they heat a liquid that you are then able to breathe in and then it's absorbed into your lungs. Um, and so they have a starter kit that's $50 which actually sounds like a lot to me, but apparently there's quite a few high schoolers that have $50 in their pockets. Um, and that gives you the device itself, the charger, and two pods, which are the things that contain the liquid. And so one of the concerning things, in my opinion, is that it's very discreet. And I think that it, it really speaks to a teen's desire to get away with it. So what actually happens is um, the, the jewels or the pods they have no smell. You can get it so that they don't have any, like, the, uh, well, it's not a smoke since it's an aerosol, but no, like, powder, no smoke-like substance that comes out when you're breathing it out. Um, they look like a USB. That's what everybody says. They're like, oh, that's just a USB. But if you look closely, it's not a USB, but how would you know? Um, and then they charge with a wall charger, and then they actually have decorations so you can decorate your own vape skin. And I feel like, to me, there's a lot of indications here that, um, again, we're seeing nicotine being targeted to young adults who are looking to get away with stuff. They're looking to maybe express their identity, and um, and we'll get into later why that's not great for a developing teen's body and brain. And so really, one pod equals a pack of cigarettes related to how much nicotine they have. It probably takes them less time to smoke or to inhale a pod compared to a pack of cigarettes. And then it's $20 for five pods, so you do the math, that's about $4 for a pack of cigarettes, or the nicotine equivalent of a pack of cigarettes. And then as they're breathing it in, it's triple the potency of nicotine. So if you think about how um, once you get addicted to nicotine, it's that reward. Well, they get this big reward for inhaling it and then mm, they reach a higher level of nicotine in their body, which then, you know, kind of keeps them coming back to that. Um, also, it can be filled with other products, so uh, CBD oil or um, oil that has THC in it could also be put into these pods, and um, they could then be um, inhaling THC, which is its own section. Um, and then I think a lot of, because of the way that e-cigarettes and jewels have been advertised, there's not really necessarily that awareness that there is a substance in here. There's nicotine. I think a lot of kids think, oh, it's fun and it tastes good. And they might not be fully aware that there's nicotine in that. So the safety of e-cigarettes. I can't stand up here and say e-cigarettes are going to kill you. We don't know what they're going to do. They're new. We don't, haven't really seen the development of the long-term effect of e-cigarettes. Um, so we know it's probably safer than um, the, they call them combustible tobacco or the regular cigarettes that you would encounter, but safer doesn't mean that you necessarily want to be putting it in your body. So um, the impact on the, de the developing brain is obviously nicotine addiction is a big concern. Mood disorders, we know that um, Nicotine can have this like effect on teenage mood swings where teenagers already have a higher tendency of having mood swings due to their natural hormones that are trying to figure themselves out. But then if you add in their withdrawal and dosing of nicotine, you're kind of heightening and lowering their base and bot or their height and bottom and then it just can have an exacerbating effect. And then impulse control. So 
if you're consistently giving in to your impulse to use nicotine, you're not really training yourself to self-soothe or tolerate and things like that. And um, as it's a stimulate, stimulant, it's not likely good for impulse control. And then it changes the way that synapses are formed. So children's brains are still learning, especially we saw the stats on middle schoolers. Their brains are definitely still growing and learning and forming new synapses and connect, connecting different areas of the brain. And nicotine actually interferes with that. Um, not ideal. And then uh, increases risk of heart attack, stroke, respiratory concerns. Um, one of the things that we've heard a lot about is popcorn lung. And it's like, why do we call it popcorn lung? I thought it was something to do with like what actually happens within the lungs, but it's actually because they first discovered this type of problem in factories that made microwavable popcorn, where there's a chemical in that substance, like microwave butter popcorn, that uh, when inhaled, when it's like heated and it's therefore an aerosol, it affects the um, the brachial branches in your lungs and interferes with their ability to absorb that oxygen in your blood and or share that oxygen with your blood and then um what they found is they're putting a similar substance in a lot of e-cigarettes um which then people are directly inhaling not accidentally in a factory like when it was originally found so now people are directly inhaling it which is then causing this long-term problem that we don't have a lot of research on because it was kind of an isolated problem until e-cigarettes. And then also with respiratory concerns, think about it, if you have an infection in your lungs, what your lungs want is clean, pure oxygen so that they can recover, but then you're putting this other substance repeatedly every couple of hours into your lungs, it's going to interfere with your ability to heal from respiratory infections. And then infections from sharing with peers. Um, if anybody's sick and you put your mouth where your peer's mouth is going to be, that's going to be, you know, contagious. And um, yeah, so that's just not super ideal. And then they can explode and cause burns. That's why they can't go in and check luggage. It's not the most stable device. Um, so that's a concern. The next area that we really like to highlight for teens is one that everybody knows about. It's alcohol. We hear about teen alcohol use all the time, but like, let's dive into what's actually happening and why it's a concern. So for alcohol, the risk to teens is that it's, it's a leading cause of death. There's not a lot of things that are endanger teenagers' health. They're, they're stereotypically robust people. Um, but alcohol and um, poor decisions made while using alcohol is one of the leading causes of death among teens. Um, and one of the big concerns that we come up against is new drivers who are then also drinking illegally and then driving. And um, a, lot of, a lot of students, maybe they haven't drank and drive, but we find that a lot of them will get in the car with somebody who's been drinking. And so that's a, obviously a very big concern. And then there's also general health risks to like repeated alcohol use in the teen years. And sometimes I like to highlight, especially like the interference with your like growth potential and things like that. That seems to be something that's a little more concrete than liver damage and bone density that kids can relate to. It's like you will literally be interfering with your body's ability to grow to your highest potential on so many dimensions, but physically also. And then it affects your brain. So this sounds a little complicated, but it's not. So there are all sorts of substances that interfere with our brain's natural release of neurotransmitters. And so when you introduce a substance that's foreign to your body, that's like made to alter your body, it interferes with how you naturally produce neurotransmitters. One of the ways that we see this a lot is, so people who are depressed tend to like to drink. Alcohol is a depressant. 
And then alcohol then interferes with their ability to feel better because maybe they drink alcohol and as your body is breaking down um, the substances in alcohol, the main neurotransmitter with alcohol is, is GABA. And what it does is it feels good. It helps you release extra feel good chemicals. But then when, like this is that hangover part, then you are actually producing less than you normally would. And so then you're like, well now I'm really depressed I need to drink, which then causes that overproduction, which leads to underproduction. And as you can see, this might start as like slightly heightened and slightly lowered, but then all of a sudden, you're probably not getting much higher heightened, but you're getting lower lowers. And so then it, it feels more necessary. And this pattern is seen in a lot of different substance use. So um, that kind of also speaks to the uh, ability to experience pleasure. So what we're saying is you're exhausting your pleasure neurotransmitters by using and then it's harder for you to get those neurotransmitters firing in a like typical healthy way. And then it creates problems with memory. So obviously if you've ever had a drink you know that maybe you're not as sharp or as quick. Well um, in teen brains that can interfere with the parts of the brain that are communicating and it can cause more permanent difficulty with memory. Obviously if a, t a teenager is hopefully still in school, they have a test, how are they going to remember things? And then missed opportunities. A lot of times substance use um, can lead to people missing school or maybe not being motivated to work hard on a test which then has a big effect on their grade which then has a big effect on, you know, their opportunities as they continue so something to think about and then this is something I'll get more into later but um, it's it has this bad effect of teaching teens really unhealthy coping skills so if you're down and you're a teenager and your emotions are kind of all over and you learn that drinking is a way to feel better when you're down you're not going to learn other ways to feel better. You're not going to learn that going for a walk or talking to a friend or journaling or reading a book or doing yoga will make you feel better. You're just going to be like, I know that drinking alcohol will make me feel better. And as adults, we can see that long term, that's not a sustainable coping skill. But a teenager doesn't think like that. They think like, feel down, must feel better. I know that alcohol helps, I'll do that. And that's what they do whenever they're down and then they don't develop those other skills that would help them regulate as adults. Um, and then it, it inhibits the development of perceptual abilities, basically meaning you're just not as sharp. And then marijuana, I actually think that there's a lot of interaction between the effects of marijuana and alcohol on a child's development. Um, this slide has a lot of information and I think that it's kind of hard to take it all in, so I synthesize it into basic bullet points. So what we know is marijuana is highly correlated with reduced school performance, and there's so many factors that come together to affect that, um, but ultimately it interferes with your brain's ability to think clearly, and then also uh, if you're using marijuana, maybe you're skipping school, maybe you're lacking motivation to do well in school, Maybe you're hanging out with a group that doesn't think it's cool to do well in school. A lot of things. Reduced life satisfaction. This is the great irony of drug use is people start using because they want to feel better, they want to feel good, and then they don't feel better long term. They feel better short term, um, but ultimately it interferes with that greater view of life satisfaction. Impaired driving, this is a concern as marijuana becomes legal in many, many states. Um, just because it's, it might become legal to use, it's still going to interfere with your reaction time and it's going to impair your driving. And I think because we haven't come up with a good immediate test of marijuana intoxication, as it were, uh, people feel like it's totally okay to use marijuana and immediately drive because they can't get caught you're going to feel more than caught if you're in a deadly accident and you kill a friend, a stranger, or yourself. And so trying to help teenagers understand that marijuana impairs you 
in a very similar way to how alcohol impairs you. Um, use of other drugs. This is what I kind of consider, you know, they're always saying marijuana is a gateway drug. It's a gateway drug. It's not necessarily the use of marijuana that's a gateway drug, but if you know someone who deals marijuana, you probably know somebody who sells Adderall or like Oxy or other substances that are maybe just that next step further. And then you, and then if you know somebody who sells those, maybe you know somebody who sells mm, cocaine and all these, the, the drug hierarchy basically. So I think of it as not a gateway because of the use, although I guess it is that way as well, but a gateway because you now have this introduction, this access to this whole world. And then some people, when they first use marijuana, maybe it's like peer pressure and they don't like it. Uh, you can feel nauseous, you can vomit. Some people are like, like it messes with their head, they call it a bad trip, so then they're very paranoid and uncomfortable. But then if you're peer pressured enough, then your body becomes acclimated to it and then you're more likely to maybe enjoy it or associate, have positive associations with using with your friends. Um, so another thing that's not often talked about is there is a high association between um, either first time or high use of marijuana. So either the first time you use or maybe the first time you use a strong amount. So either you use a dab pen when you normally smoke and dab pens are a lot stronger. You use an edible that has a higher concentration of oil than you normally eat and then what it can do is trigger a psychotic reaction. And everybody's like, that's not going to happen to me. But there is a not insignificant association between the use of marijuana and basically what it does is, I call it, it like unlocks a dormant psychotic tendency. So people who have maybe a genetic predisposition to psychosis, um, marijuana can, we don't really understand why, but it can, it can cause that, that dormant trait to be expressed. And we can't know if, oh, maybe it would have eventually been expressed anyways, but it tends to be that first psychotic episode. And so I think it goes a lot along with the paranoia and things like that. There's some interaction happening there that causes you to lose touch with reality. And then this slide is, in my opinion, the most important slide to understand teens and substance use. So there's a significant interaction of substance use because of that unhealthy coping skill dynamic of if, if you're anxious in social situations, you're like, I'll just have a drink or two and then I'll feel better. Well then eventually that's the only way you can socialize and you become terrified of socializing without being a little drunk. Um, and then depression, I, t I talked earlier about how I'm down, I'm gonna drink and that'll make me feel better. Oh, now I'm more down because I drank and exhausted all my neurotransmitters that make me feel better, I'm gonna drink again. And it becomes this kind of repeat coping skill and then that coping skill interferes with all the other areas that are sometimes helpful and sometimes stressful, kind of that natural life balance, but then it increases the stress because maybe you go to work hungover or you go to work drunk or your friends and family are concerned because you said something really inappropriate when you were under the influence and then you have more stress and then all you know how to do is use substances to make you feel better. and. So it kind of creates this cyclical cycle of, you know, reinforcement for that substance use. So I guess the big trick is to just not start and not start young, definitely. So this kind of talks about some of the warning, warning signs we found in teens. And I think one of the unfortunate things is a lot of this is pretty developmentally typical. So if, if they're all of a sudden fighting with you, if their grades dip, um, if they have a who cares attitude, um, mood changes, like if their mood seems to be fluctuating, um, if their friend group switches, um, and then obviously finding alcohol or any other substance on them or smelling it on them. Those are some things to look for. 
but ultimately I like to focus on the protective factors. What are things that are present in high schoolers that aren't using? Well, rules at home. This is one thing that people can have a back and forth relationship with, but having clear, understandable, followable, enforceable rules in their home um, from an early age all the way through helps them to regulate their own behavior because if you enforce a set of rules and they then have to regulate themselves to follow them, they learn how to manage themselves. Um, so consistent, um, predictable discipline at home, limits, rules, structure, all this stuff sounds boring but it's so good for your kids. Um, ability to make friends and healthy peer relationships. So I think of this as, okay, so what can you do? You help your kids to socialize at, at an early age and provide a pro appropriate scaffolding, get them into Boys and Girls Club, um, help them join summer art classes or something where they have to use that, that making friends muscle. Because that's a muscle. It's a skill that we learn. And the more we can support that, the better. Extended family and community support. Unfortunately, teenage years are tumultuous for all kids, whether they're using subs substances or not. So if they can have a cool uncle or a youth group leader or um, a boys and girls club coach who they're like, you're awesome, then those people that you already know and like and trust can tell your kids the same stuff that you're telling them, but they'll be more likely to listen. And then um, partnering between school and you guys, well, the parents, obviously, uh, that's a big part. So then if something's going on at school, you know about it. And if you have concerns at home, maybe you can talk to their teacher and see if they have any concerns, that communication piece. Um, helping the school to reduce bullying. Bullying is a significant problem that I, I believe we'll be addressing in future talks but that's a big concern. Building mastery. Um, one thing that people underestimate is having to do something that scares you and figuring out how to do that. Because I think oftentimes it's, it's easy to want to help your kids do their best, but what we don't understand is the kids can interpret that as, my parent doesn't think I can do this on my own. I must not be able to do it on my own. I must be really bad. And so building mastery, allowing your child to struggle and get through it, even if they don't get a perfect A, the fact that they were, they were allowed to struggle and then complete or succeed, that's, that's that mastery piece, that sense of self-accomplishment, self-competence, like I can do this. Positive physical development, so just making sure, you know, maybe, um, like the really basic stuff that seems obvious but like good adequate nutrition regular exercise go for walks as a family go for bike rides as a family get yourself outside as much as possible have active activities um those types of things can be helpful emotional self-regulation kind of comes back to the rules if they have to follow rules then they have to learn how to self-regulate their emotions um high self-esteem they need to know that you love them um, and while you might not like all their actions or all their behaviors, you love them as the wonderful human beings that they all are, even if they're not always acting wonderful. It's the behavior, not the person who's negative. Um, and then engagement and connections. So again, this comes back to like uh, after school activities, not too many, but just other places where they can connect to people. And then mentors very similar where they have somebody who's a little bit older than them but maybe not as old as their parents not that you guys are old um but somebody who that they they can really relate to who's doing well in life that they can want to emulate so what can you do first of all be really careful about your prescription drugs there there may be drugs in your cabinet that your kids know what they are uh in a less healthy context but you don't so just make sure your prescription drugs are in a place where your kids can't access them. Um, know your children's friends. I can't emphasize this anymore. Like, know who your kids' friends are because 
at this age, their friends have a, more of an influence on what they're doing and what they're engaging in than you do. Like, you had all the influence in the world until they became teenagers, and then there's this shift, this developmental shift at teenage years, where the friends just kind of take over that place. They need to learn how to live with their peers, and so making sure that you know their friends, so that you know what's going on in their life. Um, setting consistent limits and boundaries. I think people really struggle with this. It's hard when your kid's yelling at you, and they're really upset about something, and I think it's really easy to second guess, like, am I being too strict? I want to be a cool parent. You know what? You're going to be a lot cooler in 10 years when your kid is like, thank you, I was a total jerk, but I just needed you to put your foot down. And um, give them responsibilities. This is that building mastery piece that is so underestimated and I think so central to all mental health outcomes. But, like, if they have chores, if they have, maybe if they're old enough to have a part-time job, and they have to do stuff, that sense of self-esteem just develops naturally. Um, don't take the teen too personally. It's not about you. It's about all of those hormones going on. Um, when they're yelling at you and saying terrible things that they sometimes do, it really, it's about their complete internal chaos. And it's not that there's anything wrong with you or what you're doing. And it's, it's so easy for me to stand up here and say that and be like, don't worry if your kids say that they hate you. That's a really upsetting thing. And it really doesn't have anything to do with you. It has to do with where your kids are at. And that's okay. That's typical. It's normal. It's not comfortable. But now there's childbirth and you got through that. Well, the women did. Mostly. Okay. So, sign them up for activities of interest. This is, again, building mastery, art classes, sports, social groups. Um, as much as you can, allow them to choose so that they feel like they have that independence developing. But try to help them get connected to activities that they feel good about, that can be a motivating factor so that when somebody says, hey, do you want to try this dab pen, they can be like, I've got art class in 15 minutes and I can't draw when I'm high. Well, hopefully they don't know that yet. But. And then implementing weekly one-on-one -on -one check ins So just having this regular conversation with your kid, they might push back, but even when they're teenagers, kids want their parents to care about their life. So one-on-one -on -one weekly check-ins, get to, get to know where their life is at, and then listen. I think it's really easy to want to like jump in and be like, whoa, are you sure about this or that or th the other thing? They're trying on a lot of different identities and personalities. So This is about how to talk to them because um, teenagers can be hard to talk to. So staying calm is number one, two, and three. The minute you escalate, I guarantee they can escalate louder if they really want to. Or they'll do that really awesome thing where they just completely shut down and don't respond or slam the door or something like that. So the calmer you can be, and um, this comes later, but that curious mindset. You don't know the answer. You don't really necessarily know what's going on. Teenagers can be really secretive. So being curious instead of angry, like, I want to understand. I feel like this is what's going on, and I see you doing this, and you don't seem happy, and I wonder if this is about part of it. That type of calm, curious, caring. Three C's. Be prepared to listen and try not to interrupt. I think it can be really easy to be like, okay, I really want to say this, and then we've got to get to this appointment, and then we got to go here, and then we've got to run errands. No, just let them talk, because right now they really are in this space where they need to be heard, and the more that they feel like you care about what they're saying, they will care about how you respond. Um, remember what it was like to be a teen. This part is hard, because like, your hormones are no longer going wild. You're no longer in this kind of, I've never been there mindset. And so it can be like hard to understand where they're coming from. Um, teenagers get called dramatic a lot. And I always challenge parents to think if you were constantly on this like roller coaster of hormones and were encountering relationships, school pressure, job stress, like problems within your internal family for the first time 
it's so overwhelming the first time. Think about the first time you encountered any stress. Think about any time you start a new job or like just do something new. First of all, adults get spoiled. We don't have to do new stuff super often. So it can be easy to forget how overwhelming new is and for teenagers, just about everything is constantly new. It's exhausting, it's stressful, it's overwhelming. Try to remember that. And then also try to not use words such as always or never. You never talk to us anymore. You're always angry. It can feel satisfying in the moment to like really express your frustration and I think that's what you mean to do is express this like level of frustration but to a teenager it feels unfair and it probably is they're probably not always angry they're probably not never around not never around we'll, we'll count that but it's just trying to express that extreme of emotion that you feel but I guarantee they can out extreme emotion you so don't don't go for the always and nevers like like and honestly the more you can acknowledge when they behave well like I really love that conversation we had last Sunday when you stayed home like I miss having those conversations with you I wish we could have those more often more often rather than always never that kind of thing and then acknowledge that you're in it together ultimately I think that that caring piece it's like so necessary but it's like the sphere of our own children our the sphere of our teenagers and it's like do I have to like maybe I wasn't tough enough so now I'm gonna be super tough oops but then but then it's like oh I don't want to be super tough anymore um just acknowledging that for for your kids you're on their side ultimately you're always on their side and I think that it can be easy to forget that piece. So, that's about all I have for today. Um, if there are any questions, um, feel free to shout out to North Shore Center Facebook, Instagram, or um, our email address, which is on our website. And otherwise, you can shout out to me directly, uh, leave me a voicemail, extension 268 from the main line. And I hope that this was helpful. Just remember, talk to your teens, make sure that they know that you love them and hold them accountable for their behaviors, and they are not their behaviors. Thank you and have a great day.